Hey guys, Desolator Magic here. It's time for a very, very, very overdue chapter three of the official main storyline. So, you know, they got uh, five chapters of the main and five chapters of just like random other people doing other stuff. So the other one we left off with, uh, I believe it was Nissa and Jace. And they were heading up to the Skyclave, but right now, and most likely simultaneously, we've got Nahiri and her crew of Akiri, Zareth, Aura, and Kaza going to uh, get, I don't know, the Lithoform Core or whatever. So they're uh, climbing up, climbing up what? I don't know, probably another stone staircase, but uh, the Marasa Skyclave loomed above her, growing closer with each step. Soon, all the hurts of the plane would be healed, and they're going to commit elemental genocide too that that's a thing with the lithoform core she would erase the royal and make zendikar as beautiful and tranquil tranquil <laughs> tranquil as it was millennia ago um i'm pretty sure the eldrazi were there like two years ago so also i'm pretty sure that the author doesn't realize that the royal existed before the eldrazi came and wrecked the plane oh wait no the eldrazi were there a while ago because it was it was zendikar then bfc then an hour back I mean, the magic lore timeline, if anybody actually tried to make like a real actual accurate timeline, they'd probably end up locked up in Arkham Asylum. So her whole party's huffing and puffing as they uh, <laughs> went up the stairs behind her. But she really likes to run for some reason. She's very immature and impatient and annoying and moody. Kind of odd for like a three to six thousand year old person, but uh, all right. By the way, it says she stonecrafted more and more stairs, which clicked and slid into place as she took them two at a time. If you're the one making the stairs, why don't you just make them twice as big and take them one at a time? Probably because it would piss off her party behind her, who's uh, huffing and puffing and just about half dead just going up these infinite stairs. So apparently Nahiri's looking up at the uh, pretty wrecked Skyclave. Um, they got the, the pieces still floating, but they're in pieces, which is why she needs like the line slinger person. I don't know how the rest of them are going to get across, but okay. The wizard thinks he can move some basic stones, and I'm sure she can do something. So uh, also she admits uh, she built the place, I guess. Like, at least the hedrons, uh, I don't know if the whole place is made out of hedrons, but she looks at the hedrons and says, oh yeah, I built those. By the way, I hope they're getting hazard pay because it says more than once, as in more than one time, somebody in the party lost their footing and Akiri would snag them with her ropes or Nahiri with her lithomancy. Oh, that'd be when I go home. And by the way, they're kind of crawling around on like all the different floaty parts at this point. So they ask Nahiri which way to go, and because it would be convenient for the plot, she gets out the key, which somehow she knew was a key. That's convenient, but then again, she built the place, but didn't build the litho core unless she did. And would you look at that? It softly glowed and pulsed in her hand, and then she held it up to the ancient runes, and they responded. The stones at her feet began to shine and thrum in a syncopated rhythm with the key, and the stones around the party lit up. Then the glowing stone stretched out in a single line deep into the runes. Here you out there using cheat codes and console commands and crap. So, uh, Zareth, you know, being the rogue, um, he scouted ahead and he found traps, as in plural, full of poison! And archways ready to collapse. Okay, archways ready to collapse, I gotcha. Traps full of poison! It's like, ooh, spooky broken apart runes, it's hard to get through, ooh, big treasure and scary monsters, cool. But it used to be a giant high-tech floating city, kind of. So if there's poison traps there now, they were there before the city broke apart. Why were they there before the city broke apart? I mean, I'm sure the city had some security, but I mean, they're like running through basically a trap dungeon. I mean, seriously. So they heard some uh, creepy crawly creatures uh, creeping up on them, and uh, Nihiri just made some hedrons glow, and that made them run away, I guess. Yeah, I'm creepy crawly mutant rats and stuff, they ain't about that glowing. They ain't having none of that. So uh, they pretty much have no major problems uh, on the way there, and then the path ends at a massive wall covered in tiles that formed a dizzying pattern of geometric shapes and lines. Oh, I hate these! I hate puzzle doors. Never said I'm not good at them, but I do hate them. So the glowing path made it pretty clear they were supposed to like get through the wall somehow, and so naturally, Zera says, what now? Kaza says, maybe we can blow it up. Kaza, or more likely Kaza, you're invited to my next D&D party. So Nahiri is like, no, I'm just going to touch the key and then touch the wall and the vibrations and the speech of the stone. How do I get past you? She asked the stone. The stone softly replied, no fat chicks. And she's like, well, I'm skinny, so let me through. So then she's like, okay, this is some bullshit. Um, why don't I just put the key in the slot near the bottom of the wall that is exactly shaped like the key? 
So, uh, yeah, whole wall starts glowing, so she uh, says open in ancient core. And unlike the voice assistant on my phone, it actually worked. So when the door opened up, they saw a big old cavern. And, you know, I'd say this is foreshadowing, but it's not really foreshadowing when you literally say it. So <laughs> they put, but Akiri was too much of a seasoned climber and adventurer to expect that luck to last. That's just like saying it. Like that's, that's not even just the narrator saying it. That's one of the characters thinking it. We've got one of the characters thinking at me that something bad is going to happen. That's not foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is like, the place looked creepy and dark. Just then an ominous wind blew. Now we basically got a Kiri going, something about to go down. So at the end of the room is a big ass monolith. Uh, you guys know what it looks like. It's literally the card Lithoform engine. It's uh, you know, got a face carved into it and it's got Hedrons floating around it. Beams of light, crackling electricity, you know, the whole shebang. So Nahiri just looks up at it in awe and says quietly to herself, this this is what we need to finally launch Jace into space. And Zareth overhears her and says, what? And she's like, oh, nothing. I was just thinking out loud. So when they got close enough, the huge monolith just kind of split into two halves and uh, opened up. And there's the lithoform core. And uh, it says, if Akiri was honest, the core didn't seem like much. It was small, something that could fit into her hand, though large enough that she wouldn't be able to completely close her fingers around it. It shone like a small star, but it was unadorned, almost plain. So they're all staring up at it like, uh, so we all agree this is trapped, right? Like, it pretty much has to be. Um, but Zareth is like... Uh, Akiri, you, you probably shouldn't just go grab it because she moved like she was going to go grab it. And then she just gives him a reassuring nod. She suspected that if she was quick enough, subtle enough, she could avoid setting off whatever deadfall laid in wait. I'm still banking on it being what holds the entire city up. So as soon as they grab it, crash. They're going to be like falling in like effective zero G and they're going to be like, put it back, put it back, put it back, put it back. So as soon as she went to reach for it, Nahiri grabs her wrist and says, careful, because Nahiri's not that much of an idiot. So she just steps back, you know, goes back to stand next to Zareth, and, and she's like, hey, fine, you do it. So Nahiri just kind of softly puts her hand under it and reaches her fingers up and starts to kind of pull it towards her. And as soon as she does, well, for a moment, there was only silence, just long enough for Akiri to release her breath, just long enough for her to hope. Then there was a deafening crack, and Nahiri said, oh, there's some Indiana Jones shit. The surrounding chamber was disintegrating, falling, tearing itself apart. Oh, so it wasn't necessarily making the city float, it was just reinforcing the remaining structural integrity field. Gotcha. So Akiri yells, Nahiri, we need to leave, now! And Nahiri goes, really, bitch? Oh shit, I was just gonna set up the tent. I thought this looked like a great place to rest for the night. That shaking? What could that be, you think? Should we go? Let's go, I feel like going. So as they're running and the whole ground shaking and everything is going to crap... Um, basically the theory is that the Royal started on the earth below and somehow the energy is also shaking apart the skyclave, but the Royal started in like response to the magic released by grabbing the core or something. I guess like the core can either cause it or suppress it. And so now that it's free from its like giant, you know, 50 foot wide stone shielding container thing, basically instant Royal startup. So they're in for some Wisconsin style weather. So the ground ahead of them kind of rolled and then splintered like that really cool slow motion shot from the first Matrix movie with the skyscraper windows. Wait, was it the second movie where Morpheus gets kidnapped? So Nahiri pauses for a second deep in thought and yells out, was it the second movie? But then the floor explodes behind her and she has really no other option than to try to move forward over the destroyed fractured floor. Although it was actually pretty destroyed, so uh, it turns out Kaza is hovering on her magic staff with Aura clinging to her waist. Akiri thought they fell, but uh, you know, magic. So Zareth yells to them, keep going. And they're like, really? I was going to set up camp. And then Nahiri's like, I already made that joke. So as they're running, she's using her magic stone powers to try to like keep the place together just enough for them to run across, you know, whatever floor or whatever they're on. And then it just disintegrates. But eventually they hit a dead end. Before them, islands of tree covered runes floated with nothing between them but empty sky and a few hedrons. With a masterful throw, Akiri flung her rope and latched it onto a drifting ledge. Then she swung away, and you could faintly hear her yell, Bye, suckas! So I guess something happened with, like, Nahiri's rope or something. I, I didn't even know she knew how to rope swing. Um, but uh, Zareth is there, and she's like, Can I even trust this guy? Oh, now, now, not when you could have replaced him. Now you're wondering that. So she's like, we're going to have to swing over together for some reason, I guess. I don't know why his rope works and hers doesn't. They said there was a gust of wind. Does he just have a heavier rope? I don't know. So right before they're about to swing, no joke, she whispers in his ear, 
I know you want the core for yourself. And then before he was even ready, she made the stone underneath them like give way so they had to swing. So anyway, they landed on some platform somewhere. It just says the platform, I guess somewhere where Akiri landed, whatever. And then they kept running again, not addressing what she just said to him. So now it's basically raining hedrons and um, they're missing them by inches, which is funny because the hedrons are, you know, pretty big. I mean, honestly, it's going to mess up the ground next to you. I'm just saying, you know, if it missed you by inches, you're probably still in trouble. So they kept running until suddenly a vortex appeared. It sprang up without warning in a space through the floor of the floating rune. Oh, that's right. They're not technically on the ground yet. They're just on another platform uh, in another section of the city. So uh, at least two of the party members kind of avoided it a little bit by jumping out of the way. But basically it was like a tornado with stones in it, which is kind of like a sharknado, but replaced the sharks with stones and hedrons. So she's like, you guys go. Hey, stones. I do stone stuff. So she's like, I will bend the royal to my will, just like the royal in Akum. And uh, she managed to slow down a bit. Then it kind of became, you know, more of a windstorm, you know, and then it just kind of dissipated into nothing. So uh, she smiled, victorious, you know, proud that she basically stopped it with uh, pure rage and emotion, basically. Uh, but then it just spun right back up again. And uh, I sent Nahiri flying off the rune's ledge. Uh-oh. But then, as she was falling and saw nothing but the blue, cold air and sky around her, she saw one of Akiri's ropes inches away, because Akiri's the rope bra. So she reached out her hand, uh, but she missed. So she's still free-falling, but then a couple seconds later, she gets grabbed in mid-air by Akiri. Now think about this. <laughs> with, with like, you know, gravitational acceleration, and, like, let's just say that's impossible. Even if you were diving... I mean, here on Earth, like, it, I think the difference between, like, absolute arms out trying to slow yourself down in the air and, like, diving headfirst with your arms tight aerodynamic is, like, 20-30% speed difference. So, for Akiri to catch up in that time and catch her, like, from, a, like, a swinging angle or even just straight down, I, that's just not possible. Unless Akiri threw a rope and then was also on the way down at the same time as throwing the rope. I don't know. Seems a little suspicious to me and a little convenient. So they did eventually land on a piece that wasn't crumbling or shaking yet. But wait, there's more. We've added an extra benefit to your Skyclave vacation package. Once you head over to the East Wing, you'll find lava. <laughs> and Nahiri was like, why is there lava here? And then she's like, oh, the Royal must have done it. No, clearly it's a spa. It's like a, it's like a sauna. But wait, there's more. Out of the lava suddenly burst an immense, furious elemental. It emerged from the ground as if it were born from the lava itself. It literally was, that's how elementals work. My gosh, what a stupid statement. So this giant thing that she could like feel the radiated heat off of its fists, and it had coal red eyes that were glaring at her full of hate. And so naturally she forms a sword in her hand. Because that makes sense. That's how you fight elementals when you have in your bag... An object that can kill elementals. But unfortunately, Zareth rolled higher on his initiative check, and he's already swinging through the air with his trident. An arc of energy fired out from the uh, trident and hit the elemental. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't even flinch. So he's about to smack all the stupid off of Mr. Rogue there, but then uh, Kiri swings in and blocks it with some kind of magic shield wrist thing. So finally, she kind of makes a little bridge of stone over to kind of distract him, and you know, starts running and floating over or whatever the hell. And then she pulls out the core and she's like, oh, oh, is this why you're so mad? You want this? Huh? Huh? You want this? Huh? So as he stepped towards Nahiri, she raised her sword, but knew it wouldn't be enough. Bitch, then why'd you do it? You can summon a giant wall of literally lava. So she looks down at the lithoform core in her hand and asks herself, should I? The core continued whispering to her, but she wasn't able to make out the words. But words were not important. Ass whooping was important. So Nahiri's like, well, light up the nuke. So she holds up the core. It makes a huge blast, roaring energy, white light and everything. And she heard nothing. Then she felt nothing. Her world was clean. When the light from the core dimmed, everything around Nahiri had turned to ash and gray. There was nothing but silence and the elemental was completely gone. Nahiri smiled victorious. She had won. Akiri's agonized voice broke the silence. Zareth! Akiri was on her knees holding the cold, stiff body of the person she loved. She blinked, blinked again, wanting this to be a mistake, a cruel trick. It had to be. So it's heavily implied that somehow the blast from the lithoform core affected Zareth and 
my guess and my hope is that it's because he's a merfolk. Because that means she's going to end the royal and the merfolk. Now, I'll be the first to admit, in my past, pretty much the entire history of my channel, I've been calling for the genocide of the merfolk on every single plane. I hate them. And they're hexproof, flying, unblockable bullshit. They're terrible. Their culture is terrible. They're terrible people. Their magic is terrible. Their hippie nature bullshit is terrible. They are just awful. And you know what? They can take the damn slivers and the goblins with them for all I give a shit. I say drop that core into Mount Mordor or wherever the hell they're going, blast the entire plane, and kiss the royal, the elementals, and the merfolk goodbye. So remember, Nahiri had it in her hand. So the fact that she wasn't uh, affected by the blast is interesting. So anyway, she had dropped the core and uh, Akiri was really fast when they both, you know, kind of came back to their senses and she got to it first and she held it and she's like, what is this thing? And uh, she mad bros. And Nahiri just answers with no more storms or disasters, no more hellish monsters, including the merfolk. This is our chance. So she looks at the extremely dead Zareth and says, our chance. You know, why didn't Aura walk over and just be like, I still have like a level seven spell slot. I could just like resurrect. You know what? I want to see where this goes. Now you two argue it out. So Kiri's on the edge like, I'm going to drop it. Don't come near me. And she's like, I should probably hook onto the nearest Hedron, which is coming closer and glowing with dark energy. That's weird. And then all of a sudden it gets close enough that she's like, huh, I can't move. It's almost like Nahiri knows some kind of stone magic involving hedrons or something. And hedrons are used to like use magic and trap people. That's so weird. I wonder how that happened. So she just calmly walks up and takes the lithoform core, and then she's like, I'm sorry, Akiri, I really am. So then Nahiri puts a hand on her shoulder and just pushes her right over the edge. And she toppled back and fell. The last thing Akiri saw was Nahiri standing with a cold, calculated look in her eye, and the core hovering, or, yeah, the, 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 the like the lithoform core, not the core K-O-R. Boy, how did that not come up yet? Anyway, hovering in her outstretched palm. Then there was only sky, endless and cruel. Except it's not endless because this is the end of the chapter. So what about the cleric? Where's Aura or whatever whatever his name is? In fact, where's Kaza? I guess they, they were last seen floating on a big staff broomstick thing or whatever. Well, here he's probably going to lie to them about what happened. But uh, yeah, I think we see who the villain of this story is. Crazy, obnoxious, immature, single-minded, dumbass Nahiri. I can't wait for Nissa and Jace to slap all the stupid off of her. That'll be fun. Although not really, because you guys know I'm on Team Merfolk Genocide. So, um, you know, hashtag kill them all. So anyway, thanks for listening to uh, this wonderful chapter. And uh, sometime in Chapter 5, they kill all the Merfolk. I'm getting a cake that says, yay, the Merfolk are all dead. Uh, I'm going to make somebody at the local Dairy Queen write that on a cake. And I will eat the entire thing on a mukbang video on live stream. <laughs> So anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next video.